Welcome to today's session of the Winter Spring 2024 CFR Academic Webinar Series. I'm Irina Faskanis, Vice President of the National Program and Outreach at CFR. Thank you for joining us. Today's discussion is on the record and the video and transcript will be available on our website, cfr.org slash academic, if you would like to share the materials with your colleagues or classmates. As always, CFR takes no institutional positions on matters of policy. We are delighted to have Thomas Graham and Zhang Yuan Zoe Lu with us to discuss China-Russia relations. Tom Graham is a distinguished fellow at CFR. He is a co-founder of Yale University's Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies program and sits on its faculty steering committee. He was special assistant to the president and senior director for Russia on the National Security Council staff, uh, during which time he managed a White House Kremlin strategic dialogue, and he was director for Russian affairs on the staff uh, from 2002 to 2004. His most recent book, Getting Russia Right, was published by Polity Books in October 2023. Zoe Liu is the Maurice R. Greenberg Fellow for China Studies at CFR. Previously, she served as an instructional assistant professor at Texas A&M's Bush School of Government and Public Service. Dr. Liu's most recent book, Sovereign Funds, How the Communist Party of China Finances Its Global Ambitions, was published by Harvard University Press in June 2023. So Tom and Zoe, thanks very much for being with us today. I thought we would start with you, Tom, um, talking about Russia's relationship with China, and then we will go to Zoe for her perspective on China's relationship with Russia. So over to you. Oh, there, thank you very much, Irene, and it's a real pleasure to be here with um, with all of you today. But let me start by saying that the uh, Russia-China relationship began to improve in the very late uh, 1980s, the late Soviet period, after a period of intense rivalry in the 1960s, 1970s, and early 1980s. Uh, it slowly continued to improve in the post-Soviet decades, uh, but it really accelerated in 2014. Uh, with the with Russia's seizure of Crimea uh, and its fomenting of uh, rebellion in the eastern uh, regions of Ukraine at that time, this led to a serious deterioration in relations uh, with the West. Uh, and Russia at that time began to turn more uh, to China as a counterbalance, uh, as a, another option uh, in managing its relations on the global stage. And clearly, the relationship has taken off uh, since 2022, the Russian invasion uh, of uh, uh, of Ukraine, which led to a total collapse in relations between uh, Russia, Europe, and the United States. Uh, and Russia needed China uh, as that counterbalance, as that other great power on the global stage that would provide the type of uh, backing that it needed uh, to persist in its uh, growing conflict with the West. And what we've seen over the past two years uh, is... Uh, Russia increasingly relying on China uh, for support in many areas. First on the diplomatic stage, uh, despite the fact that uh, China abstained in many UN uh, resolutions about the uh, condemning Russia for its aggression against Ukraine, it still has uh, in its public pronouncements supported Russia's version of what has happened, NATO aggression as the fundamental factor leading to the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, and it's also continued to coordinate with Russia at the UN Security Council and other international fora on a range of geopolitical economic issues that are important to the two countries. Second, uh, as Russia's relationship and trade with the, with the West began to collapse uh, under the weight of Western sanctions, uh, the bilateral trade with China became critically important uh, to uh, the Russia's, Russia's economy. Trade between the two countries has soared over the past uh, three years. It now reached uh, in 2023 of the level of $240 billion. Uh, that is about uh, more than twice what it was uh, in 2019. It's not only been the trade, uh, China has also uh, moved in to provide the types of consumer goods uh, that the Western Western companies used to provide that could that they no longer could uh, under the sanctions regime. So if you travel to to Russia today, particularly in Moscow, you'll see a lot of Chinese cars uh, that you uh, didn't see just a couple of years ago. 
Chinese smartphones uh, have replaced iPhones uh, as the smartphone of choice uh, for Russians. Um, in addition, uh, China also became a, a lifeline as far as the export of Russian oil was concerned. Um, uh, Russia now exports uh, roughly half of its uh, of its oil to China. It was significantly less uh, before the conflict in Ukraine began. Uh, of course, Russia provided that at discounted prices, but nevertheless, it was an important source of revenue uh, for Russia that allowed it to continue to fund uh, its military operations. Uh, in, in Ukraine. And finally, there has been a significant military support. China has not provided the, any lethal aid and any significant amounts as far as we are aware, but has provided many dual-use items, uh, things like trucks or excavators that were important for uh, building the trenches that uh, provided a, a very solid defensive line for, uh, for Russia in Ukraine over the past couple of years. And in addition, uh, there continue to be very close um, uh, military cooperation, joint exercises uh, that demonstrated that Russia had uh, an important ally on the on the global stage, uh, and also uh, Russia continued to sell uh, important, sophisticated military equipment to China as a way of demonstrating uh, the t the closeness of the strategic alignment. Uh, and final factor has been the relationship between uh, Xi and Putin. Uh, these two uh, leaders have met over forty times. Uh, in the past decade, but most importantly, they've met face to face twice since the beginning of the conflict, once in Moscow uh, and once in, in, in Beijing, again, underscoring the close political uh, relationship uh, and making the point from the Russian standpoint uh, that the Western efforts to isolate uh, uh, Russia on the global stage have in fact failed. Uh, just very quickly, there are a number of factors beyond uh, the Xi-Putin relationship that underlie uh, this uh, and undergird this relationship. Uh, the economies are complementary. Russia provides natural resources. Uh, China provides ma manufactured goods. The two countries are brought together by uh, a common resistance to what they uh, see as a U.S. effort to dominate the global stage. Uh, uh, and, and finally, the, the two countries do have uh, authoritarian, syst uh, authoritarian systems. Uh, and bureaucracies that are compatible and make a for a close working relationship between the two countries. Uh, so what we've seen is a growing strategic alignment, uh, and this has uh, grown much deeper over the uh, over the past couple of years. All that said, it's important to remember that there are significant frictions in the relationship uh, that are uh, concealed by this uh, desire to push back against. Uh, West, uh, uh, Western and particularly U.S. Um, uh, policies on the global stage. There are still historical grievances that date back to uh, Russia's seizure of Chinese territory in, in an unequal treaty in the 18th century. Uh, there are strong nationalist and racist elements uh, in the two countries. And then the final uh, uh, factor that I think uh, creates a great deal of friction is the very asymmetric relationship between the two countries. China's economy uh, is 10 times the size of Russia's at this point. That gap is con continuing to grow. Uh, the relationship very much is tilted in China's favor at this point. This is something that uh, will be a factor over the long term and will lead to, I think, to increasing uh, friction in the relationship. But it's not going to do that until uh, both Russia and China have dealt with what they see as the U.S. challenge. So let me leave it there, Irina. Thank you, Tom. And Zoe, let's go to you now to uh, give your perspective on China's relationship with China and react to whatever um, what Tom just shared with us. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Irina, for having me. And it's truly a great pleasure to be here, especially with Tom, uh, to do this event with our um, local and uh, university partners. So I wanted to pick up a little bit on what um, uh, Tom mentioned in terms of bilateral trade. What finally, uh, China's latest trade number just came out a few days ago. And what surprised me the most is that uh, if you just plot the numbers, plot the numbers in terms of who China is trading, has traded, has traded more over the last year, and whose trade grew the fast, actually, you will be surprised at least I am surprised that China, despite that the United States remains to be China's largest trading partner, but U.S.-China trade has 
declined the most. Whereas China's trading with Russia, as uh, Tom co uh, correctly pointed out, reached a record high and grow uh, the most significant. So, in so this is what this is why I wanted to sort of focus my um, my perspective on uh, yes, China Russia, but more on the China Russia in the global context. And I guess you know the way that I I see China Russia relationship has always been. Um, yes, you know we do see increasingly over the past over the past decade. You, there is a strong argument to say that China and Russia's uh, interests uh, have converged. But I think this interest convergence should also be in, examined in the broader context of China's uh, changing relationship with the existing global uh, system, and this global system is also led by the United States. So in other words, I guess what I wanted to say is China-Russia's relationship, as well as the seemingly interest convergence today, is qualitatively different from the 1950s Sino-Russia alliance. And as Tom also correctly pointed out, you know, the two countries' the relationship really significantly improved uh, both bilaterally and multilaterally over the past three, two or three decades since Sino-Soviet split, especially after 2000s. I, you know, a few timeline or milestones just uh, on top of my mind would be uh, you know, 2000, 2001. Um, we, all, we are familiar that um, in December 2021, uh, China joined the WTO. But also in 2001, China and Russia signed the Treaty of Good Neighborness and Friendship Cooperation. <laughs> And then uh, 2001 was also when the Shanghai Five Group was uh, received a significant upgrade into the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which has since evolved into the largest regional organization that does not include the United States. So uh, from that perspective, I guess what I wanted to really emphasize uh, or uh, to uh, 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 to emphasize is that you know China's relationship improvement with Russia. Is all has also been taking place in the broader context of China's relationship improvement with the United States and U.S.-led multipolar uh, world up until perhaps the recent ten years since President Xi Jinping took power uh, in two thousand thirteen. And um, I the the what Tom mentioned struck me, and I wanted to emphasize was you know the 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 shift. The, the shift of angle in terms of 2014. And I do think that Russia's annexation of Crimea and in particular uh, the West or you know, UK, European, several European countries the threatening of kick, uh, kicking Russia and Russian financial institutions off uh, the SWIFT system at that time, it was a big wake up call for not just for President Putin, but also for uh, the Chinese policymakers as well, because um, you know, global financial crisis was the first time when Chinese policymakers try to implement renminbi internationalization. The whole idea was to uh, was more economically oriented. The idea was to uh, hedge currency risk. You know, China was the one was the largest trading partner of so many countries. And yet, whenever China was doing trade or Chinese entities were doing trade, uh, the, the inevitably, because of the dominance of the U.S. dollar, there will be inherent economic and currency cost. Right. So. And about Russia's annexation of uh, of uh, uh, Crimea in 2014 and the threatening of kicking Russia off SWIFT from China's perspective as well as Russia's perspective, you know, the dominance of the U.S. dollar become some a sort of non diverse non diversifiable risk in the existing system. Therefore, you started to see not just President Putin were interested in developing um, the Russian version of SWIFT, but China actually accelerated the development of a renminbi-based uh, financial infrastructure. Although previously in the immediate aftermath of global financial crisis, the motivation to develop broader use of renminbi and the renminbi uh, financial infrastructure was mostly to hedge or uh, reduce China's economic vulnerability but uh, uh, later you started to see the geoeconomic factor there and um, the the convergence of China and the Russia in terms of hedging the geoeconomic risk of the dollar's dominance or for that matter US hegemonic power really accelerated after 2018 during the Trump administration with the heightening of uh, US China trade war and obviously in since Russia's or Putin's war against Ukraine um now this time 
uh, the West actually did sanction, not just to put an oil, oil cap on Russia's uh, energy export, but, but, but also uh, kicked Russian financial institutions off the SWIFT. Now this, you, uh, this, this recent development accelerated a lot of this development towards uh, removing or reducing their dependence on the dollar, not just for economic purposes, but also for geopolitical reason. And China and Russia not only see eye to eye each other bilaterally, they have also been uh, trying to expand regional blocks such as the BRICS, such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, with the goal to basically form a um, anti-American or an anti-American dominance, uh, not necessarily alliance, but a partnership. And at the same time, um, China and Russia also see the, the opportunity, at least in the energy transition and the Russia's relevance in continuing the support of energy uh, demand, not just in Russia, but also in a lot of these emerging market economies, including India, including uh, many parts of Southeast Asia and the Latin, Amer Latin America and, uh, and Africa. So from that perspective, you know, China and Russia does, the, the interest convergence is not just bilaterally, it's also in the global and multilateral framework. And perhaps the moment when, uh, what, what really worries me now is, is that, um, it's not necessarily say that at a people to people level, you know, there is a tremendous convergence between China and Russia, because fundamentally, I really do not think Chinese people are at a people to people exchange level. Chinese people are interested in going to Russia. I think I am a good example. You know, I was born and raised in China and I become an American citizen. And, uh, you know, my my family all encouraged me and my generation to come to study in America rather than going to Russia. And then now you see the same. You hear Chinese families complain that they no longer have, or they have less and less opportunity to study in America, people never complain that they couldn't go to Russia, right? So the people to people level exchange is not, not something that worries me. What worries me is really about, uh, is really at a strategic level, the perception in Beijing that America is doing all it can to contain China's economic, gro economic growth. Um, this sort of push that China having less an alternative, but have to depend, have this strategic alignment with Russia. And I think this is not just economically or financial or, or militarily dangerous, uh, perhaps it's even more dangerous in the long run, such as challenging the US, the, the US dominance, not just economically or militarily, but also financially in the global financial system. Now, the moment when China and Russia were able to expand this alternative economic and financial or currency system uh, to offer a hedge or even a, or, or, or a, even a refuge or a shelter uh, to American sanctions, I do worry that we are going to lose a lot of our uh, leverage against you know, regimes that are not uh, considered as our friends or even our enemies. I'll just stop there. Fantastic. Now we are going to go to all of you for your questions. Uh, please click the raise hand icon on your screen to, to ask a question on an iPad or tablet. Click the more button to access the raise hand. Uh, and when you're called upon, accept an unmute prompt, state your name and affiliation followed by your question. And you can also submit a written question via the Q&A icon. You can vote for other questions you'd like to hear asked or answered from your window at any time. And we will alternate. Uh, so the first question, I, let me just see if we have raised hands yet. Okay, we will go to Stefano Cavalier, Cavallari. And if you could identify yourself, please. Uh, uh, good afternoon. My name is Stefano Cavallari. I'm attending an executive uh, master's in international relations at the CSIS, Syracuse University, Maxwell College. And I'm going to prepare, a, uh, my capstone project is about uh, um, uh, basically this uh, shift uh, uh, proclaimed by Russia uh, to, to the east, uh, to the Indo-Pacific, uh, which uh, a policy which was uh, proclaimed uh, uh, after the annexation of Crimea. Uh, so, so uh, Professor Liu mentioned this convergence of interests, but at the same time, I think we must uh, recognize that uh, Russia is a revisionist power in Europe, but not in the Indo-Pacific. 
while China is a revisionist power in the Indo-Pacific, but not in Europe. So I think that this creates a kind of uh, a lot of concerns about uh, this uh, strategic alignment, uh, uh, whether it is really possible or not. So I want to know your view, uh, both from <clears throat> Professor Graham and Professor Liu, about uh, this uh, policy uh, uh, go to the to the to the east, and if uh, my understanding is that it might for Russia could be useful in order to exploit the the Arctic route from then reaching Vladivostok and then from Vladivostok uh, to even to India as the Chennai Maritime Corridor and also to Japan or to Australia, especially for shipments of liquefied natural gas. This could be something to interesting for Russia, but I don't see for China. I see a lot of competition, especially in the South Sea uh, China. So I want to know your, your views and uh, if it makes sense for really for Russia to become a kind of Pacific power, because Russia has never been a Pacific power, right? Not even air carriers, just the submarines, right? So your view. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to go first on that, uh, Irina? Should I take a stab at answering you, that you, Absolutely. Thank you, Stefano. That's a very, um, it's an important question, uh, but a very complex one, uh, as you indicated uh, in, in, in your commentary. Uh, you know, first, um, there were good reasons uh, and good strategic and economic reasons uh, why Russia began to look eastward. Um, we all know that uh, global uh, economic growth was taking place in East Asia, the Asia Pacific region. Uh, it was a very dynamic part of the globe, uh, economically, technologically, and so forth. <clears throat> and so uh, Russia, uh, which had been excessively reliant on Europe uh, for trade and investment, uh, needed to diversify. And uh, East Asia uh, provided a, uh, a, a an obvious way, uh, the way to do that. Uh, it accelerates, and, uh, and President Putin announces this, uh, turn to the east uh, in 2014, 2015, uh, because of the sharp deterioration in relations with the uh, with the West as a consequence uh, of uh, Russia's seizure of uh, of Crimea. So uh, it becomes a, um, in a sense, a uh, not a forced option, but a a possible outlet for Russia uh, in order to deal with the growing challenges it's facing. It was facing in the West. Um, and that has undergirded the uh, the relationship over the past uh, decade and will for several years in the, into the future. All that said, uh, there are frictions in the relationship that will play out over time. Uh, some we've already talked about. Uh, I think the uh, one in particular that is concerned in Russia uh, is what I mentioned before, this great asymmetry in power uh, between the two countries. Uh, where you look at sort of the economic uh, development of the two countries, uh, China clearly in the lead, and that gap between the size of the Russian economy and the Chinese economy will grow in the future. Technologically, uh, China has probably surpassed uh, Russia in uh, in its capabilities. Um, you look at uh, Chinese activities in space, Chinese activities in artificial intelligence, and it really dwarfs what Russia uh, is doing at this point. So there is some concern uh, in Moscow about how this relationship with China will develop over time. Uh, and if you talk to Russian experts, Russian officials, I think there's an understanding that if not now, but certainly if you look forward to the 20, 2030s, that Russia needs a hedge against China. Um, and what it's trying to do is develop that hedge right now in Eurasia and the global south. The Organizations that Zoe talked about, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the BRICS, uh, are rightfully uh, elements of a perhaps an alternative uh, international order from the standpoint of both Beijing and Moscow. But from Moscow's standpoint, uh, these are also efforts to uh, cons constrain China within a network or a web of relationships uh, that will uh, allow Russia to feel more comfortable uh, in containing whatever Chinese ambitions might be uh, geopolitically, economically, uh, particularly in the regions that are most uh, that are adjacent to, to Russia. So uh, very good relations at this point. 
There are good strategic reasons for that. From Moscow's standpoint, as you look farther down the road, uh, Moscow is concerned about growing Chinese power uh, and beginning to think about how it might hedge, back, hedge against that uh, in 2030 and beyond. Zoe, do you want to add to that? Uh, sure. I guess I'll just add a, a little bit of a footnote to uh, what Tom just mentioned. Uh, one thing, uh, you know, Stefano, your excellent question uh, raised and caught my eye was, you know, your 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 correct identification of uh, revisionist power in different contexts. And I think you are correct. Um, and I also think it's worth remembering that uh, despite the convergence of uh, interest in certain areas, as Tom mentioned, um, the, the uh, fundamentally important fact is that China's rapid economic rise, uh, in particular becoming the second from one of the poorest countries in the world to the second largest economy, China's rapid rise did not benefit from a good relationship with Russia. But because of China's uh, inter or the America's uh, socialization of China, welcoming China into joining the U.S.-led global system from WTO and so on and so forth. So from that perspective, despite that the uh, Russia and uh, and China under the leadership of Putin and um, and uh, and Xi Jinping, they have you know a respective ultimate goals in terms of changing or revising the ex existing global order. But I have to say their levels of grumpiness against the existing system are very different and for different reasons. At least for China, the goal is not to completely abandon the existing US-led system because China still need very much so, especially now with the investment screening and export controls, China still very much need a good relationship or, in, or reduced tension with the West in order to, for its to create a better environment for the Chinese economy. Uh, whereas for Russia, the situation is completely different. And I think you correctly also identified areas where the Chinese and, uh, and Russia would, 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 would have a lot of competitions. But to what extent, I, I think that the existing competition uh, is all, I, I would view it in the, through the lens of, again, changing global environment. Pre-Russia invasion of Ukraine, perhaps there will be more international partners who are interested in investing in Russia, like in, uh, especially, for example, in Russia's Far East area to develop the Yama uh, uh, LNG project and so on and so forth. But since uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a lot of Western partners, as, as well as the Japanese and the Koreans, they started to divest their asset ownership. So from that, this perspective, I would, I would echo what uh, Tom mentioned, you know, this unequal relationship uh, in the changing global environment perhaps makes Russia economically and financially perhaps reliant on China uh, more. Now, uh, the issue you raised with regard to the Arctic, uh, the Arctic transit route and uh, uh, the relatively competitiveness in the global sea lane, here, uh, per, my, my, I, I would say that, yes, it, it is right that China, although China is not necessarily a Arctic power, but it does have a seat in the Arctic Council. Uh, now, with the climate change and uh, energy transition, I think not just the China and the Russia find themselves relevant for the changing sea lands, um, but the, you started to see countries like Norway, they wanted to be more uh, active in this, in, in the so-called, in the governance of global commons. So perhaps from that perspective, whether China and Russia can compartmentalize areas where they uh, have tensions versus where they think closer alignment would result in better benefit for them, um, that is an issue. To what extent they can compartmentalize uh, those issues? But excellent question. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take the next question, which is written from Robert. Mo Gielnicki, who's an adjunct assistant professor from Georgetown University. Do you believe that the current state of China-Russia relations has significant implications for the Middle East? If so, where and how? And should we expect more cooperation, alignment of interests, more competition, or a healthy dose of both in this region? Who wants to take that question? I can take a first stab at it, and then Tom can correct me. Um, no, no. <laughs> so, uh, so Robert, thank you. I see where you are coming from, and thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I do see. I, I mean, you you do research in this area, so obviously you have a view. But I do think that there is a significant implications um, on at least two aspects. The first part is 
uh, energy. Uh, obviously, the uh, you know, if I were Saudi Arabia, I would not be happy to see that um, uh, the West, despite the uh, oil price cap on Russian oil ex export, somehow uh, sabotaged Saudi Arabia's oil export share in the Chinese economy. But now Russia is the largest oil supplier to China, as Tom correctly pointed out. So from that perspective, it has implications in the short run in terms of who could provide uh, more shares for the Chinese economy or for that matter, uh, the the overall uh, energy the overall energy supply to China and India. Remember the price, despite the price uh, oil price cap for Russians oil export export is China and India leading the wave of purchasing Russia's oil. Right. So from uh, we can debate to what extent the price cap matters, but at least uh, if I were Saudi Arabia, I would not be happy. And then. Uh, secondly, uh, the financial implication is, is also very significant. Um, obviously, uh, GCC countries in general, uh, Saudi Arabia would be the undisputed leader there. If, you know, the moment that America not only kicked Russia out of the SWIFT, but also seized Russian reserves, you know, guess who is more worried? I think, yes, China is worried, but Saudi Arabia is even more worried. So from that perspective, the implications for, for the Middle East is, 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 is tremendous. They would have to reevaluate to with whom they wanted to be aligned uh, more closer. Now, obviously, with the tension in, 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 in uh, the, 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 uh, the, the Gaza situation, the Red Sea, Pose renewed attention or even potential spillover the new spec or renewed spec between Russia and uh, and Saudi Arabia. But with all that being said, uh, perhaps we will see GCC countries to be more uh, making more strategic move. Perhaps they would they they would want to learn uh, a few pages from India's playbook, trying to balance the relationship between the East and the West. Uh, to what extent? Uh, Saudi Arabia could be uh, adopt India's sort of uh, foreign policy position. That's that is an unknown. Uh, uh, that that is relatively unknown because ultimately the United States still is the guardian of the Gulf. We still have a stronger military presence in the Middle East. Yeah, I, uh, Robert. I think this is a very good question. Uh, you know, as I look at the the situation. Uh, the question I would ask is the extent to which uh, Russian and Chinese interests overlap uh, in the Middle East at this point, particularly in the context of the current uh, of the current conflict. Uh, you know, China uh, continues to be concerned about the, the flows of energy exports out of the um, out of the Middle East. That's important for China's own uh, growth. It's not entirely reliant on Russia, nor does it want to be as far as its uh, energy uh, sources are concerned. Um, so they have to be concerned about uh, the instability, some of the things that the Houthis are doing in that region, uh, some of the Iranian goals in that region in a way that Russia doesn't, um, in part because, uh, uh, you know, instability in the Middle East could have a positive impact on uh, uh, on oil prices, which is an important component of the Russian, uh, of the Russian federal budget. So I think there's a little friction there uh, that won't necessarily play itself out uh, dramatically in the near term, but it's something I think that people in Washington need to keep in mind. Uh, the other uh, issue here that's worth uh, considering uh, is that both Russia and Iran uh, are in some ways competitors for uh, entry into the ch or. Uh, for, uh, control a share in the Chinese Chinese energy market. There's another place where uh, Chinese and Russian interests don't fully overlap uh, in, 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 in the Middle East. Uh, so uh, a, a sort of clever uh, policy on the part of Washington would be aware of these differences uh, and would try to look to see if there are ways that they can exploit that uh, in, in the future. There are areas where our interests overlap with China in terms of stability, uh, uh, that uh, it's not necessarily an interest of Russia. So there are things that the United States could do in its public uh, and diplomatic posture uh, that may introduce an element of, uh, of friction in the relationship between Russia and China, which would clearly be good from the standpoint of our interests right now. Thank you. I'm gonna take a, a question from J.Y. Um, Zhou. Uh, with a raised hand, and I did not pronounce your name correctly, so if you could correct me, that would be great. 
Uh, my name is Chris Nelms. I'm a student here at James Madison University, and I had a question on Russia and Chinese relations in the sense of Africa. How much coordination and cooperation is there between the two nations when it comes to their operations in Africa and their both their economic and military and political aspects? Thank you. See, Zoe might know more about uh, this. As I think this is a very good question. Uh, Chris, and one that we uh, we need to focus on. Uh, you know, my take on the question would be that there's not a great deal of uh, cooperation or coordination uh, between the two countries when it comes uh, to Africa. China has clearly been much more Afric uh, active in Africa uh, over uh, in in recent years for again a whole host of reasons that are important for uh, China's economic development. Uh, access to resources, farmland, and we can go through the, the list. Uh, Russia's interest uh, in Africa uh, has been of a, of a different sort, um, more focused on um, uh, providing uh, security uh, to certain regimes in Africa to gain access uh, uh, to certain resources. Uh, the point I would make here uh, is it's not clear to me the extent to which uh, Russian activities in Africa have actually been a well thought through and coordinated uh, activity coming out of the uh, out of the Kremlin. Uh, we've heard a lot about the role of Wagner forces uh, in Africa uh, in in recent years. I think it's important to remember uh, that the Wagner forces uh, were a private military company uh, that they. Uh, didn't necessarily uh, factor into uh, all the decisions that the Kremlin uh, has made. Um, in fact, the, the Wagner forces, its, uh, its leader uh, recently, uh, uh, who has, uh, as we know, was, uh, was killed last summer, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, in fact, had his own interest. Uh, and the way I, I see it working is not so much as acting under Kremlin uh, direction as his uh, developing interesting ideas for his own commercial uh, purposes and then checking with the Kremlin to see whether those ran contrary to uh, Kremlin interest or not. So I, the short, arc, uh, the short point that I'm making here is I think Chinese have pursued a much more coordinated policy in developing the relations with Africa over the past several decades. Uh, the Russian policy has been a bit more chaotic, involving private actors, government actors, um, and that the two countries have largely operated in uh, in different dimensions on the African continent. Uh, and therefore, I don't see, maybe Zoe has better information than I do, any particular extensive coordination uh, of the two countries' activities uh, in, in Africa. And I don't expect to see that going forward either. Um, I would agree with, with, with Tom in terms of, you know, the lack of uh, concerted effort. Uh, between or co cooperation between China and Russia in the context of of Africa, although uh, you know uh, uh, South Africa and recently Egypt become uh, members of the expanded uh, uh, South Africa was members of the BRICS much earlier, but then you know recently Egypt was also part of the expanded version of the BRICS. You know you you see China Russia share this kind of platform with a lot of these African, with African economies through the context of BRICS dialogue, BRICS uh, summit. And, uh, um, but that's from, from my research, I think that's pretty much it, you know, um, and uh, uh, China and Russia also see Africa very differently as um, Tom correctly pointed out. If you think about China's early, China's engagement with Africa, actually it's not just recent years or it's not just through the lens of Belt and Road Initiative. You know, China started its economic engagement with Africa back in the, 19, in the 1950s. Um, you know, at that time, China was one of, the, perhaps one of the poorest country in the, in the, in the world. Uh, and despite the China's economic backwardness, the country under uh, revolutionary leaders like uh, Mao Zedong and, uh, and Zhou Enlai, they started foreign aid to uh, African countries. They built railways like Tanzania, uh, the Tanzania Zambia Railway and so on and so forth. So from that perspective, you know, China's economic relationship or economic engagement with Africa it does not really start. The origin was not economical to begin with. 
it is with the support of Af the majority of African countries, you know, mainland China or Beijing were able to gain the seat and replace Taiwan and gain the seat in, in, in the UN. So from uh, now, you know, fast forward, it, seem, it, it seems that a lot of the conversations has been like, is China doing a new commercialism and a new, new mercantilism and, it's, and things like that? But ultimately, China sees Africa not just from the lens of natural resources, but there are broader uh, geoeconomic and geostrategic plans behind that. And a very important piece of China's uh, engagement with Africa also uh, resonates with China's uh, China's reckoning itself or the identity of a developing country because having the identity of developing country, having that name tag is very important for China in the existing global trading system, such as, you know, getting the benefit of uh, w certain WTO preferential treatment and so on and so forth. So again, uh, whereas a lot of these concerns are less so clear for Russia, However, uh, I, uh, Tom correctly pointed out, you know, the private security firms, uh, the, the Wagner Group's model uh, is something that a China and Chinese uh, private security firms, they are aware of, but China can't, the Chinese private security firms, they cannot afford to go on that route for political reasons, but then obviously economic for for political and economic reasons, but fundamentally, I think the the, the, the outside look like on this, when China, you know, China's presence or the at the, the 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 upgrade of the Djibouti the Djibouti port into a military base was already uh, very 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 contentious. So China, in many ways, cannot afford to go down the Wagner Group model. But it's not that doesn't mean that China is unaware uh, of that kind of business model. Thank you. I'm going to go next to a written question. Uh, from Nicole uh, Diaz. Uh, thank you so much for your insights. I was wondering if you could explain how our China and Russia relations regarding disinformation campaigns in other regions of the world, do they cooperate or do they act by their own to improve their international image? Uh, and uh, Nicole is, is a student at New York University. I'll take a first stab at that, and then I said Zoe will add and correct as as necessary. Uh, first, I think this is a very important uh, issue, uh, and Nicole, and one is going to uh, garner a lot of attention. You know, particularly here in the United States, as we move towards a uh, a, a presidential election in November of this year. I would say there's a fundamental uh, difference between uh, the way China. Uh, conducts its information or disinformation uh, campaigns abroad in the way Russia does. Uh, you know, China uh, has been focused largely on uh, presenting a, a positive in, image of China itself. Uh, Russia has been focused more on disruption, uh, and it tries to use disinformation, its disinformation campaigns in the United States, uh, not to present a uh, uh, a a pleasant or attractive image of Russia as much as it is to uh, exacerbate uh, tensions inside the United States. So it looks for fault lines uh, in the political system. Uh, it tries through its, its, its social media and other methods uh, to widen that dysfunction uh, in the United States. Um, this is sort of in line with uh, where Russia stands on, on a lot of issues. And I think it's a fundamental a sort of difference in the way Russia approaches international affairs and the way China does at this point. Zoe has already talked about a sort of attitudes towards uh, towards the current world order. Russia is clearly focused on disruption. Uh, it's displeased with what it calls American hegemony. It's trying to undermine that through all means possible uh, in the belief that it has not benefited in any significant uh, uh, degree from the US-led uh, world order. China, as uh, Zoe pointed out, has drawn some benefits uh, from uh, from this uh, this world system. Doesn't want to see it entirely overthrown. Although I would probably would like to rebalance it uh, in a certain way uh, that would be advantageous, uh, more advantageous to China. So think of Russia as as a disruptor, China more as a revisionist uh, in the sense of uh, wanting to rebalance a system 
uh, more in its favor, but not uh, out to destroy the uh, system or to disrupt the system uh, to the extent that Russia is interested in doing that. Uh, to 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 um, I, I guess I just wanted to add one little thing to what Tom uh, ju explained just now, uh, which is the audience. You know, I think uh, Tom is absolutely right in terms of Russia being disruptive, trying to sort of seek uh, create a wedge in terms of create a wedge, seeking the fault lines in uh, Western political system, especially in an election year. Whereas I think the audience, the Chinese uh, Chinese uh, media or uh, misinformation campaign is more focused, is more targeted at both the Chinese domestic people as well as the Chinese, di Chinese overseas diaspora. On the one hand, they are focusing on, uh, for the global audience, they focus on telling the, using President Xi Jinping's word is about uh, telling the Chinese story and uh, telling the Chinese story well meaning they wanted to present a good and a positive image about China, combating the global campaign about, you know, China is doing bad here and there. <laughs> so that's what they are trying to do there. But then on the other hand, China has been do trying very hard to show that, well, while you know all these things about China, let let, 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 let us tell you what, what are the bad things about the Western system. Um, especially for the domestic audience, you know, I constantly get 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 emails and um, and uh, as well as uh, you know messages on social media, um, like WeChat and WhatsApp from my Chinese friends, saying that you know, like the recent one was uh, the border dispute, the, the 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 refugee crisis, in American border, and people are, on Chinese social media, people are obsessed that there is going to be a civil war in America, going to go going to sort of disrupt the the entire world, like. So, you know, this kind of misinformation campaign, I think it's, it, it, the, the audience is also very different and obviously the content is different. Thank you. I'm gonna go next to a raised hand from Wilson Wameo, who's calling in from Poland, I believe. If you can identify yourself. Hello, uh, good evening. It's good. It's evening here in Poland. Uh, I'm Wilson Wameo. Uh, I'm studying Master's in International Relations, International Security and Development, sorry. And uh, my question to our guests is, um, I want to know uh, in all this relationship between Russia and, the, and, uh, and China, uh, what is the place of uh, Taiwan in all this? Uh, can we also say that there's a, a factor of uh, China supporting Russia because uh, it has the same problem uh, in the issue of Taiwan because uh, uh, if you if you look at this, the two cases there are some kind of semblance uh, in the situation so where is the situation where is the where is the part of uh, uh, Taiwan in all this can we can you say something about it uh, in all this uh, I could start. Again, Irina and, and Zoe, uh, who knows sure. uh, the, Ch the Chinese angle that is much better than I do, can uh, then sort of add or subtract as necessary. Uh, again, it's a very good question, Wilson. The point I would make is that uh, I see more differences between uh, Ukraine and, and Taiwan than similarities. I mean, one of the reasons that China has abstained uh, in UN votes uh, uh, concerning Russia's aggression against uh, against Ukraine is that it was a clear violation of the territorial integrity uh, uh, of Ukraine. Um, uh, you know, this is something that China hasn't supported historically. Um, Taiwan uh, is, from the standpoint of, uh, of Beijing, an integral part of China. Uh, and it certainly doesn't want other countries um, uh, separating Taiwan from uh, from China uh, over the over the long haul. So uh, I think you know the way China thinks about these issues uh, are are quite different. Um, from the Russian standpoint, um, uh, you know it enjoys uh, uh, or needs uh, a Chinese backing uh, in order to maintain uh, its uh, its uh, its position on the. Uh, uh, on the, the conflict uh, uh, in, in Ukraine. All that said, uh, I don't think that Moscow believes that it has to come out uh, 100% in support of the Chinese position on Taiwan. And I don't think uh, that 
uh, that China is necessarily expecting that in a conflict situation. Uh, these two countries do have different interests. Uh, Russia more for, focused on Europe. Uh, China, obviously, East Asia, but a, you know, uh, broader than that. Uh, Russia would provide no more support to China in a tiny, tai, tai, Taiwanese uh, scenario than China is providing Russia in the Ukraine scenario. And my guess is that it would actually, in, in fact, have less to offer. Uh, that wouldn't necessarily undermine the relationship. Um, I think the two countries realize that they have uh, different interests. The point that uh, Moscow and, uh, and Russian officials always have met about the relationship with China, it's not an alliance. Uh, we're not always together, but we're never against one another. And that's what they would, uh, the position they would take on, uh, on a Taiwan uh, scenario. Uh, uh, we're not going to be against uh, China, but we're not necessarily going to be fully supportive. Uh, I, and uh, I think, you know, in, from from so many aspects, Russia's facilitation of the separatist movement in post-Soviet states, uh, as well as Russia's earlier recognition of um, uh, Mongolia, uh, which leads to the separation of Mongolia and, 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 and the Chinese territory. You know, a lot of this really contradicts one of the fundamental tenets of Chinese foreign policy, which is the inviolability of national sovereignty. And that's something that China always emphasizes while, and that's, that's also a cornerstone piece of China's policy towards Taiwan, which again, China considers as the core of the core interests of China, right? So from that perspective, you know, Beijing is finding itself a very hard, you know, very, very difficult situation um, with regard to uh, the Russia's war against Ukraine. And it so far has not caught it as an invasion, but what is it? <laughs> so from, and the Beijing also find itself sort of sandwiched in between the West and, and, and Russia. Um, but I do think that, um, mainland china and taiwan has has learned both of both both sides have have learned important lessons from the russia's war or putin's war against ukraine on the mainland side side i think at least beijing felt that or have already expressed their feeling their the fear that external intervention is becoming a bigger threat in managing the relationship with taiwan You've seen uh, we, we've seen Chinese policymakers talking about this in the National People's Congress, as well as the, the two sessions. You know, we were talking since last year. The government report emphasized that you know we need to rather than emphasizing Taiwan in uh, Taiwan uh, local separatist power, they emphasize international intervention. And then, uh, secondly, I think Beijing also recognized that. Um, the need for self-sufficiency, a lot of the co Taiwan contingency also propelled Beijing to realize you know, if there were a Taiwan contingency, Beijing at least to, needs to prepare the economy, the mainland economy, to be able to endure uh, severe back Western sanctions. And uh, if not, um, you know, at least making sanctioning China even more costly or at least equally costly for the sanctioners. Thank you. I'm going to go next uh, to a written question from Susan Notch, uh, who's studying at the University of Utah. A Salesforce commercial proclaims that data is the gold of the AI frontier. Uh, 60 Minutes highlighted how well China's positioned to become dominant in all sectors because of longstanding control of data and the use of AI and data management. Having taught several students from China, I admire China's cultural wealth of a strong educational foundation for those who qualify for higher ed opportunities. These two factors will quickly put China in the lead in many sectors. Where does Russia stand? Uh, where does Russia stand in, in big data and AI? Um, I think the short answer is far behind the United States uh, and, and China at this point. Uh, Russia devotes relatively little of its GDP uh, to research and development. Uh, as a percentage of its uh, uh, GDP, it's probably uh, one half um, uh, or less of what China or the United States devotes. And it's of a GDP that is about one tenth the size of the American and the Chinese economy. So that gives you a sense of uh, sort of what Russia's effort uh, is in this uh, realm. It doesn't have the access to the big data 
uh, that China does, nor that the United States uh, does. So uh, it will try to make uh, uh, some some progress in this area. Uh, but the two global leaders here are going to be China uh, and the United States. And Russia is going to be uh, a distance that I wouldn't even say third in this regard to probably other countries uh, that are more advanced in this area than Russia will be. Um, I uh, would agree with yes. with, with, with Tom. Um, one, but, but I also at the same time see limited space of cooperation between China and Russia. I remember if I, Tom, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember last year there was this China-Russia uh, joint declaration in which the, the two, again, stated as they always do, saying that we are going to seek cooperation in advanced technology and so on and so forth. And in addition to that, um, there is also this China-Russia uh, technology Industrial Cooperation Fund, which is financed by uh, the fund is capitalized by Russia's sovereign funds, which is not being sanctioned by the West and uh, China's sovereign fund. Um, then there is also additional Russia-China RMB investment fund. So through this kind of a joint ventures, there might be a small pocket of money for the two countries to explore uh, uh, corporations in big data and artificial intelligence. But the limits is that given that both China and Russia are under, uh, in terms of in terms of um, uh, scientific development, uh, in particular semiconductor and the chips and quantum computing artificial in intelligence, a lot of these are under severe U.S. export controls. So from that perspective, I think Russia probably is going to lag, lag, lag behind, not just the United States, but also China. <laughs> Yeah, well, let me just make one point here. I think you always see this this talk about cooperation, but AI gets to sort of fundamental elements of power uh, in the uh, in, in the current period. Uh, and China, no matter what its relationship with Russia is, is not going to give it access to the uh, the core secrets uh, of its national power. There's not that type of trust between Russia and China nor is there that type of trust between, obviously, between China and the United States. So this is a very, this is an area of competition. Um, both the United States and China uh, want to compete and they want to come out uh, uh, ahead in this competition. Uh, nobody's going to bring Russia along as a competitor. Great. Well, we are at the end of our time and um, we have so many questions, but I thought I would just take uh, the moderator prerogative to ask you the last one. Sorry, we couldn't get to all the questions. Um, we have a group here of uh, students and professors, and I thought maybe you could just say just a short uh, few words about going into government or academia and, and the value of doing so. And Tom is more equipped to say because he has so many hats. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tom. Well, so you can too, but uh... look, I mean, they're two different, uh, two different areas. Each has their, um, each has their place. Uh, the point I would make: I have served in government, uh, and I think there's no greater honor uh, than working in the service of uh, of your country. Um, and so I would. Um, urge people who are thinking about careers to seriously consider it. The pay is not as good uh, as in the private sector, but the issues that you get engaged in uh, and the, the chance to do uh, good and get involved in uh, doing good, not only for your country, but uh, farther afield uh, cannot be compared um, in any place outside of government, as far as I, uh, as far as I, as I am concerned, so I have a preference for government, but academia uh, obviously has a, its value as well. Academics are truth seekers, uh, and we actually need a lot of truth uh, in government. Uh, you try to manipulate um, um, the truth in order to create facts that are advantageous to your own country. So that's the way I would uh, divide uh, uh, the two professions going forward. And Zoe, any in words of inspiration from you? Uh, sure. I think you know the. Uh, I I think you know both my parents and uh, my mentors have uh, have told me that you know before I be a good scholar or anything anybody else. Um, you know, they have always emphasized that as though you want to be a good person. I think being a good person is important. Either you, either you serve for the government or, or or work as an academia. The idea is, you know, you want to be a person that at least you you do you you are somebody who 
people would want to work with you. I think I, I, I benefited a lot by following the instructions given by my parents and my mentor. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, sorry to put you both on the spot, but um, it's always good to hear that perspective uh, for um, students who are thinking about what they're going to pursue uh, in their lifetime. So thank you for that um, and for this terrific hour. I, again, I'm sorry to all of you, we couldn't get to the questions and comments, but I, I commend um, Tom Graham and Zoe Lou's books to you all. Uh, for the professors on this call, if you are so inclined to assign their books in your class, um, they would be happy to do a Zoom with your, your, your students. So I will put that out there. If we're, we're, we have get hundreds of requests, I may have to walk that back, but I wanted to offer that here. Um, so again, uh, you can um, follow their work uh, also on CFR.org. Um, the next academic webinar will be on uh, Wednesday, February 14th at 1 p.m. Uh, with Esther Brimmer, who is a senior fellow in global governance at CFR, um, talking about uh, governing the global commons. Um, and again, I encourage you to learn about CFR paid internships for students and fellowships for professors at CFR.org slash careers. Follow uh, at CFR underscore academic on X and visit CFR.org, foreignaffairs.com, and thinkglobalhealth.org for research and analysis on global issues. Again, thank you to both of you and to all of you for joining us.